Chapter 41, Is It Wrong to Hate Einstein? A. Swallenstein The Sword Princess and Fastest Growing Adventurer in Orario Ever since she had joined the Loki Familia, Ace had obtained countless accolades and praises. A calm and collected warrior. A cold young woman who was always composed. But at that moment. What, did I just feel? She watched the mysterious man with white hair and crimson eyes dash away carrying that goddess. As she did, she reflexively glanced back down at her sword. It was a masterpiece blade, but it wasn't unbreakable. In that moment where she reflexively acted, Ace channeled both her mana and Avenger to attack. A move that should have cracked the blade to its core. But it was fine. Not only that, but... She tightened her grip on the blade. How? She saw the sword cut through. But in an instant, it had vanished and reappeared in his hands. Was he that much faster than her? Stronger? Was that how he could tell? No. More than that. Ace narrowed her eyes and pursed her lips. She was sure of it. For a brief moment, she felt a monster's presence overlapping with that man's form. Not only that, but she felt that presence as well. The one who had slain her father and taken away her mother. Geez, Ace. I told you that you've been spending too much time training. A familiar voice broke Ace out of her thoughts. Leffy Yaw's voice. Ace blinked and then saw that the half-elf was standing in front of her. Leffy Yaw sighed and then grabbed Ace's hand. This is why I said we should have some fun. Loki stepped forward and nodded. Leffy's got a point, you know? We can't have our cute sword princess attacking any old couple just because they're so disgustingly sweet. Leffy Yaw gave a serious nod and said, that's right. Even if they should get a room. Ace blinked and tilted her head. I don't understand. Loki laughed and patted Ace's head. Don't worry about it. Now, let's go try out some more cute dresses. We got one for Lefi so now it's your turn, he he he. Lefi Yaw gave Loki a blank stare and said, If you do anything weird, I'm going to tell Lady Riveria. Loki straightened and saluted Lefi Yaw. Understood, ma'am. Lefi Yaw shook her head and then started walking off, tugging Ace with her. As she did, she muttered, Maybe Captain Finn was right. We might all need a break from all of these events happening. Triple X. Loki smiled and watched as her two cute children walked off together. But then she turned back to look at where Hestia and that bell had gone off. A naive demi spirit, hi. That shrimp didn't know anything about Ace. And she wasn't like Freya who had her scary eyes that could see through everything, so that information didn't come from the shrimp. And Loki saw it too. The shrimp didn't expect that comment, even though she went with it. Which meant that her bell figured it out by himself. Just who is that guy anyway? A man who Hestia loved enough to lash out with her arcanum because he could have been hurt. A man who could avoid Ace's attack while disarming her. And a man who put Ace on guard enough for her to reflexively attack him. Matt. Loki laced her hands together behind her head and started walking off after Ace and Leffy Ya. Even if that guy was weird, he was someone that Shrimp chose. And while Loki hated to admit it, the Shrimp was definitely a better judge of character than her. So for now, she'd ignore it. That man didn't mean anything by saying what he said, and the shrimp didn't want anything to deal with them. Although. Loki cracked one of her eyes open a bit more as she watched Ace glancing back towards where Hestia and Belle left. This might be messy later. Triple X. What did you do that for, Belle? I set Tia down on the ground while I adjusted my shirt. What was what for? Tia huffed and said pulling me into your arms and then running away like that. And not that I didn't like it, but that was a serious situation. I brushed down my pants and then smiled. All the more reason to get us out of there then, right? We're on a date, and we can't have a good one while other people are bothering us. Tia covered her face and let out a deep sigh. I can't believe you sometimes, Belle. That's because I'm unbelievably awesome. Tia swatted my arm and said, you're just lucky you're handsome. I chuckled and said, should I tell that to Fina? Seems like her mommy's the sort to judge on looks. Tia rolled her eyes and then started adjusting her dress. After that, she looked around and said, did you have plans here in Deadless Street, Belle? Not really. But it's a good place for a stroll, right? After saying that, I took a look around. A haphazard and winding street. 
uniform buildings that looked the same in every direction, and when they didn't look the same, they had countless alleyways. In short, the sort of place that a person could easily get lost in without a proper map or directions. Of course, I didn't need that since I was me and could mark places with mana. While we were on the move, I had perfectly mapped out the entire area. Although. I glanced towards a powerful mana signature that seemed to be radiating from the depths of Deadless Street and frowned. Tia noticed and said, what's wrong? Nothing. I sighed and said, just have a feeling that life's going to get more complicated soon. Tia rolled her eyes and then wrapped herself around my right arm. If you were worried about that, you should have listened to me and become something other than an adventurer, darling. And you need to try a bit harder than that if you want to be seductive Tia. Though you don't have to be. I gave Tia a warm smile and said, I was already enchanted the moment I met you, my dear goddess. Humph. Tia huffed and leaned her head against my arm. Don't think you can get off that easy. I'm still upset about what happened earlier. Tia frowned and said, that cutting board. Calling another goddess a cutting board is a bit much, don't you think? I paused, remembering how Tia roasted Loki. Well, there was a reason why she was considered a goddess of fire too, I guess. Tia rolled her eyes and said, I've called her worse and she's called me worse. It's fine. Now. Tia tugged me along and looked around. Where are we going, Belle? I started walking, taking the lead, before saying, easy there, wifey. There's plenty of daylight left. Besides, there's a lot we don't know about each other, right? Tia swatted my arm again and said, stop with that silver tongue of yours. It's because of that thing we were in trouble with Freya. Right. Sorry. I frowned and said, force of habit. Not mine though. Maybe accelerating Bell's growth was bringing out his natural tendencies? And maybe he was meant to be a playboy? I mean, Bell was the MC of a harem manga or something, right? I thought I was keeping it in check, but I might need to do dedicated speech therapy. Maybe start scolding women instead. Ah, wait. That would just draw the weird ones to me. I decided to set that issue aside for the moment and focused on Tia. Anyway. You like reading, right, Tia? Is there a reason for that? Tia paused to consider it and said, not really. I enjoy stories, but I guess it just became a habit. Back in heaven I didn't really have many friends, so stories and books became my companions. You know I love you, right Tia? You do. I blinked. Oh yeah. Haven't said that outright yet. I coughed and said, I I do. I mean, isn't that obvious? Tia looked away and blushed. And no. I mean. I guess so. You're always flirting with other girls, but you draw the line pretty harshly, so. Gah. She shook her head and glared at me. You shouldn't say these things so casually, Belle. Right, right. I'll remember to say it in a more serious setting next time, Tia. Tia's face turned a darker shade of red and said, why you don't have to. But I want to. And it'll be more fun seeing you squirm then. Tia was already cute, but seeing her embarrassed was even cuter. S squirm. Tia looked at me and then I caught her eyes flicking down for a second. I blinked and then did my best to ignore my face heating up. Instead, I stared at her and said, Tia. W what? I didn't look at anything. Sure. Yeah. Let's play along for now. Today was meant to be a wholesome and romantic date, not one where we end up in a hotel room or something doing the lovey-dovey. Yet. Though I probably should start working on that before Freya starts trying to work Tia over for a threesome or something. But first, cute and romantic date. Triple X. Damned Einstein. The passage of time passing entirely on where you're standing, the theory of relativity. It really was true. Chatting with Tia about various things. Getting to know each other a bit more, like favorite colors, foods, and activities. Discussing various stories and what sorts we liked. Speaking of which, I learned that Tia adored happy endings, but couldn't help herself from reading tragedies since she thought those were more realistic. That, and she felt that those stories deserved to be remembered so that the people who suffered didn't do so in vain. That raised a big red flag. Paired with the fact that Tia had apparently risked getting sent to heaven by using her arcanum before meant that I'd have to be extra cautious about things. I had a feeling that if push came to shove, 
Tia would do a heroic sacrifice to keep everyone safe. For the record, I despised tragedies and exclusively read happy endings. And when I came across a story without one, I tended to either retcon it in my head or retcon it in writing to fix that. But anyway, time passed by in a flash. And before either of us knew it, the sun had fallen and gotten replaced by the moon. Then, to top off our date, we shared a long and sweet kiss while staring at the starry skies from the edge of a clock tower balcony. It was sweet and unforgettable. Romantic and precious. And yet. It's already time to get back to work, hi. It was now the morning after my date with Tia. And on that morning, I stood in front of the Freya Familia building and did my best to ignore the pointed glares from all around me. Glares that were coming from people that were absolutely stronger than me. Not that I'd lose just because they were stronger though. Right now, I was coming up short in pure stats, but in terms of lethality, I'd developed quite a few trump cards due to the realization of my precarious situation as an MC and the inevitable troubles coming my way. I sighed and then pressed the strangely modern doorbell next to the imposing iron gate before me. A soft chime echoed in the distance. The glares on me became sharper. And then. You are brave for walking alone into enemy territory, Bell Cranel. A firm and powerful voice echoed from the distance. Shortly after, the gate opened on its own, revealing the speaker. Otter. I chuckled and waved at him and said, I've gotta do this much to take responsibility, right? Killing intent. Enough to cause any ordinary person to faint. But to me, killing intent was just another energy. Apparently. Hi. That was a new one. I quietly gathered up the killing intent and stored it away in my inventory for later. Otter smiled and then walked forward, placing his hand on my shoulder. Yes. You must do at least that much. Then. Let us depart. The sooner we accomplish our task for Lady Freya the better. Right. That task. I glanced back at the mansion, tracking a few people glaring at me with pure malice. After that, I looked back at Otter and said, you'll give me pointers along the way so I won't die a stupid death, right? Of course. Otter's smile widened and he said, Lady Freya mentioned that you have great potential. I will do my best to draw it out along the way. An imposing aura. Otter was being completely benign in both his speech and mannerisms, but why did I feel like I was going to regret asking that? And why was the infamously aloof and cold Otter staring at me with burning passion in his eyes? Go easy on me. No such words exist for a hero. Now come, there is work to be done. Ha! Huh. Chapter 42, Is It Wrong to Not Know the Meaning of Life? Evening, in Freya's private room within Babel. There, three goddesses had gathered while waiting for the start of the banquet of the gods in a few hours. Hestia adjusted the form-fitting black dress that Freya lent her and then looked into the full-body mirror nearby. When she did, Hestia frowned, carefully spinning in place to examine herself. It was a pretty outfit. Unlike her usual bright blue bow and white clothes, the dress Freya lent her was mostly black, with only a bit of white around her shoulders and chest. Paired with the black ribbons that Freya also lent, Hestia was sure that she gave off a more mature vibe. Even so. Am I growing a bit? Staring at herself in the mirror, Hestia couldn't help but think that. She knew that her clothes had been a bit small recently, but Hestia thought it was just because she had been eating a bit much. But the woman in the mirror. It was definitely her. But at the moment, it looked like people would double take if Loki called her a shrimp again. Freya walked over to the mirror and smiled. Like Hestia, the Norse goddess was wearing a form fitting dress. It was a bit different in style though. Unlike Hestia's dress, which had shoulders to support the top of her dress, the top of Freya's dress had bare shoulders and was being held by the thinnest of silk strings. It was still an elegant ball gown but it looked like a wardrobe malfunction waiting to happen. Freya glanced at Hestia's reflection and then let out a calm smile. Perhaps it's the maturity of motherhood, Tia. Hephaestus walked over as well to look at Hestia's reflection. The goddess of the forge was also wearing an elegant black ball gown that night. But to reflect her origin as a blacksmith, she was also wearing a few accessories. An obsidian and gold necklace, golden trimming at the top edges of her dress to properly support it, unlike Freya's, a golden armband, and most importantly, a golden sword at her side that had been forged by the man she loved. Hestia eyed the sword Hephaestus wore at her side and raised an eyebrow. Are you seriously planning to carry that around, Fafi? 
Hephaestus blushed a bit, but then she held her head high and said, Of course. She rested her hand on the hilt of the sword and let out a warm smile. With how much love wealth put into it, how can I not? Hestia gave her a blank stare and said, Weren't you the one worried about drawing attention because of the kids? Isn't carrying around a ridiculous sword like that even worse? Hephaestus waved her hand and said, Don't worry. It's sealed and just looks like an ornamental blade. She glanced over at Freya and said, Even you can't detect anything from it, right? Mm. Freya stared at the sword and said, No. You've done a great job of concealing it. Hephaestus looked at Hestia and said, See? It will be Dash. It's a pity though. Freya interrupted Hephaestus and sighed. To think that the crystallization Krasos pure love and affection would be smothered like this instead of being revealed to the world. She glanced at Hestia and said, It's a bit tragic, isn't it, Tia? Hephaestus flinched, but she quickly recovered and said, At least it's a mutual love, unlike yours. Freya smiled and said, You say so, but does your child know that? Hephaestus winced and then lowered her head. Hestia sighed and said, Could you stop jabbing at Fafi, Freya? You know she has her circumstances. If you say so, Tia. Freya turned away from Hephaestus and then helped adjust some of Hestia's ribbons. As she did, she gave a sidelong glance at Hephaestus and said, Though, I just have to say. If it came between choosing my familia or the man I loved, I would choose him without a doubt. Hephaestus pursed her lip, subconsciously resting her hand on. Hestia glanced at Freya through the mirror and said, That's my belle you're talking about. Freya nodded. Yes. And I'm his mistress. Say that again after I marry Belle. Hestia stepped away from Freya and then glanced out the window at the setting sun. In any case. Should we get going? Hephaestus looked out the window as well and then sighed. I suppose we should. She reached up the scratch the back of his head and said, I'm still not prepared though. She looked over at Freya and said, Are you really going to back us? Freya smiled and said, We're a sisterhood of Divine Mothers, are we not? Of course I will. Hestia resisted the urge to sigh again at Freya's shameless insistence. Instead, she nodded and said, Then. Let's go. She put a serious expression on and prepared herself. For the sake of her family. Triple X. Fina was enjoying herself. Although she was a bit sad because both mommy and daddy were busy, she was happy because she got to spend lots of time with her friends. And not only that, today she managed to earn some rent money. Since mommy was busy, she couldn't work her job at the stall making yummy jagamaricans. And since Fina was still too small, Mr. Owner wouldn't let her cook them. But Mr. Owner did let them borrow the stall to sell some things with Pira. Ah, but only with an adult watching them. But Miss Lion was there to help, and even Miss Artemis came along. Uncle Wealth wanted to come too, but he was in the middle of a secret project, so he stayed at home to watch the house. But anyway, after a long day, it was time to count their earnings. Fina opened the bag of their earnings and dumped the coins out on the kitchen table. Staring at the glittering gold, she smiled and said, Look, Pira. We got a lot of coins. Pira's eyes sparkled and she said, We did. And they're pretty gold too. Right? It's super pretty. Raiwa walked over from the kitchen and set down a platter of sandwiches cut into cute bite-sized pieces. After that, she pulled over a seat and sat down next to the girls. Remember to eat. Oh. Fina nodded and said, Thank you, Miss Lion. She smiled and grabbed a sandwich piece off the platter. Pira smiled and said, Yes. Thank you, Miss Lion. After that, she grabbed a sandwich piece as well and carefully started eating. Meanwhile. Fina munched on her sandwich and started counting out the coins. One for her, one for Pira, one for Miss Raiwu. Oh. And one for Miss Artemis too. While Fina was counting, Raiwu grabbed her own sandwich piece and made herself comfortable. After taking a bite, she frowned and mumbled. Still. To let children manage a stall like that even with supervision. Is it that the children were too charming, or was the owner that careless? Artemis walked over with a pitcher of water and some cups. Pouring out drinks for everyone, she sat down and smiled, I believe it was more because of you, Miss Lion. She slid a cup over and laughed. The poor man was terrified of your aura. Raiwa raised an eyebrow. Was he? 
Fina paused in the middle of stacking the gold coins and then stopped to think. M.M. I guess Mr. Owner had been acting a bit weird. The kind old man was extra kind that day. He didn't even ask for money from them like he did with Mommy. Ryu stiffened and then frowned. It seems that I must be more vigilant. I thought I had become accustomed to controlling my strength. She sighed. Truly, Belle is a terrible influence. A door opened, followed by footsteps. After that, Welf's voice called out. We talking about Belle over here. Pira's eyes lit up and she dashed over. Papa. Welf smiled and picked Pira up, giving her a warm hug. Heya, Pira. Had fun today. MMHM. Fina held up a handful of coins and said, We made a lot from selling some toys. Toys. Welf raised an eyebrow and looked at Ryu and Artemis. Ryu let out a wry smile. Triple X. At the Ganesha Familia residence, the banquet of the gods was in full swing. Lively chatter, livelier arguments among certain individuals, and both good food and good spirits, in both sense of the words, were being passed around. Despite that, off in a corner of the room, a certain blonde messenger god sat by himself, casually observing a small figurine he bought earlier that day while he was disguised and gathering information. Even your granddaughter is amazing, Zeus. Hermes spun the rough figurine of Bell in his hands and said, to be able to make a magic item that repels monsters from scraps like this. Fina had called it a good luck charm. And most adventurers probably bought it because she was cute in selling it. But the truth was that it really would be good luck, at least to those who were worried about getting ambushed by monsters. Though, for those who wanted to hunt them down, it might be more like bad luck. Watch up to over here by your lonesome, Hermes. A tomboyish voice called out. Loki's. Hermes slipped the figurine away in his suit pocket and smile. Just playing with some toys. M.M. You and your kids like to do that a lot, don't you? Loki glanced at where Hermes put the figurine away and said, anything good. Just a little interesting trinket. Hermes grabbed a nearby bottle of wine and an empty glass before pouring some for himself. Now. Hermes folded his arms on the table and smiled. You wanted information. Chapter 43, Is It Wrong to Advance the Plot? The Eye of the Storm. A place of calm amidst absolute chaos. That was what Hestia felt like as she walked into the Ganesha Familia mansion alongside Hephaestus and Freya. The plan was to arrive as late as possible. In that way, there were last chances for people to question them. That was Freya's suggestion. Hephaestus didn't like it very much, but Hestia agreed with it. After all, if they were going to draw attention to themselves anyway, better to do it in a super public manner. Though. I didn't think it would be this much. Hestia did her best to avoid showing her panic on her face while striding across the hall. As she did, she inwardly thanked her past self for having the foresight to wear boots instead of heels. If she hadn't, Hestia was sure that she would have tripped and embarrassed herself on that sparkly tile floor. Was it because of Freya? Hephaestus? The fact that Hestia had changed so much? Or was it because news had already started spreading about her mystery child and Belle? Hestia didn't know, but she did know that everyone was staring at her. Maybe because she was taking the lead. Freya had suggested it. Since Hestia was still relatively new goddess here on Earth, having Freya and Hephaestus behind her would help by making people think twice. After all, even though Hephaestus was Hestia's friend, she was also known to be fair and impartial among the gods. Paired with the fact that Freya of all people was also standing behind Hestia. Yes. Calling the hall a storm would be appropriate. While swallowing down a nervous gulp, Hestia ignored the pointed stares at her and walked towards the host of the party. As she did, Hestia casually took a look around at the surroundings. The countless staring gods and goddesses aside. The Ganesha Familia mansion was weird. That much had been evident from the fact that it was located inside a giant statue of said god of beasts. But despite being weird, it was well furnished. An inner courtyard with private booths that were blocked by hedges. A running stream of water flowing around the perimeter. A water fountain in the center of the main hall, set with another statue of Ganesha as a centerpiece. And then a pair of spiral staircases leading upstairs to more private venues. Delicious foods and fancy catering were laid out along the sides of the courtyard, along with drink carts carrying expensive wine and spirits. 
a serve yourself layout with glasses and plates set out for people to grab what they wanted. And people had already done that as the party was in full swing by the time Hestia had arrived with her entourage. Which made the hushed silence that filled the venue when they arrived even more striking. But Hestia ignored it all. Instead of worry, she put on a soft smile and walked towards the host of the banquet who was standing in front of the water fountain. Silence, broken only by the sound of Hestia's footsteps and the clattering of heels from Freya and Hephaestus behind her. And then she had arrived in front of Ganesha. Again, it was silent. And that silence was starting to grow heavy. But Hestia endured it and gave a small wave to Ganesha. Thanks for inviting me, Ganesha. I appreciate it. A man bearing his trained body for the world to see. Wild black hair, an orange elephant mask covering his eyes, and an orange sash paired with white pants and boots. Ganesha grinned at Hestia and then said, I am Ganesha. Instead of thanking me, I thank you for accepting, Lady Hestia. I will not forget this favor. They were meaningless words. Hestia didn't have or do anything for Ganesha for him to say that. But she could see that it was his way of trying to set her at ease, so she smiled back at him. Freya walked up at that time and casually looked around the room. After that, she gave an approving nod and looked towards Ganesha. It's a bit excessive, but you've certainly earned the title of Banquet of the Gods for hosting this, Ganesha. Ganesha laughed and said, Thank you, Lady Freya. I am Ganesha, and I am honored for the praise. Hephaestus walked over as well and nodded. You've done well. I was a bit worried that you'd overdo it like last time, but it seems you decided on something simpler this time, Ganesha. I am Ganesha. Grandeur and showmanship go hand in hand with Ganesha. But I decided to listen to my children for this feast. He chuckled and then said, and thank you for lending your scarce time to attend this feast, Lady Hephaestus. Hephaestus smiled and didn't say anything else. Instead, she simply rested her hand on her sword and idly looked around the room. Calm and collected responses. Without giving an explanation as to why they were with Hestia, both Freya and Hephaestus naturally talked with Ganesha and then stepped back. The moment they did, a low murmur echoed around the room. Hestia felt sweat drip down her back and inwardly thanked the fact that it wasn't visible because of the black cloth. Good job, past Hestia. White would have been a terrible fashion choice. Although. What did they do now? Freya tugged Hestia's hand and said, I'm feeling a bit parched, Tia. Why don't we all enjoy ourselves a few drinks while we're here before finding a private spot? Right. That was the cue. Hestia casually, at least she hoped it was casually, turned her head to look at Freya and nodded. That sounds wonderful. Allow me. With that, Hestia took the lead again walking over to a drink cart with Freya and Hephaestus in tow. Triple X. Ugh. That was so nerve-wracking. Hestia mumbled and downed a glass of fruit punch. Freya smiled and said, You did well, Tia. She sipped on a glass of dark wine and said, One would have never expected such confidence from a newly descended goddess. Hestia refilled her glass from a pitcher she pilfered and said, I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing, Freya. A private booth on the upstairs balcony, overlooking the courtyard below. After that little display, the three goddesses grabbed some refreshments and headed upstairs. Hephaestus sipped on her own glass of wine and said, it will eliminate some troubles at least. Right now, you've shown that you're confident and that you have something to fall back on. It seems to be us, but people are probably wondering why we would help you in the first place. Seated next to Hestia, Freya set her glass down and nodded. Indeed. She gave a sidelong glance to the gods staring at them and said, It must come as quite a shock to have one such as myself endorsing a relatively unknown goddess like yourself, Tia. Hestia sipped on her fruit punch and muttered, I still can't believe it either. Stupid Belle. Why did her lovely Belle have to be so ridiculous? Hephaestus tilted her head from across the table, listening into the conversation around them. As she did, she said, on the bright side, it looks like the talk of the party is why we're together instead of Fina or Belle. For now. Hestia sighed and said, we've distracted them a bit and bought some time. She glanced down at Ganesha giving an impassioned speech and said, and Ganesha hosting Monsterphilia will help too. But the Denatus is coming up. At that time, we won't be able to avoid it. Hephaestus winced. That's, true. Freya sipped on her wine and chuckled. Relax you too. It will be fine. 
Hephaestus frowned at Freya and said, I don't see how you're so calm. There's less than a week left. And plenty of time for our beloveds to work their magic. Freya set her glass down and said, Besides. In the worst case scenario, I can dash. What the hell was that? A crude and tomboyish voice cut in. Loki, wearing a black sleeveless dress, matching gloves and black heels. An elegant outfit that clashed with her tomboyish nature. Freya's eye twitched for a moment, but she quickly smoothed her expression and glanced over at the unexpected guest. Good evening to you as well, Loki. Shut it, Freya. Loki glanced between Hestia, Freya and Hephaestus and said, Since when were you three a thing? I thought the shrimp didn't have any friends. And I thought you hated hanging around other people, Freya. Hestia snorted. I have plenty of friends. Mostly because I'm not a rude goddess like you who butts in when she's not needed and shamelessly wears a tight dress with nothing to show for it. Loki reflexively crossed her arms over her chest before scowling and said, at least I'm not shameless enough to show up late. Hestia leaned back and smiled. What do you mean? I was perfectly on time. Didn't you see how Ganesha didn't start his welcome speech until after I arrived? You. Loki gnashed her teeth. Hephaestus glanced at Hestia and quietly muttered, Bell is a terrible influence. Freya smiled at Loki. A pleasant expression, but one at odds with her cold gaze. Is there a reason why you're here instead of enjoying yourself among the other gods, Loki? Yet. Yeah. Loki plopped herself in the seat next to Hephaestus and said, What's up with you? My kids got their weapons trashed in our expedition and needed repairs but I just heard back from the Hephaestus familia that we got dropped because of some urgent project you had. Hestia blinked and looked at Freya. Freya blinked and then looked at Hephaestus. Hephaestus coughed, reflexively holding and looking away. Freya blinked again and then smiled, her violet eyes flickering with realization. Shifting her attention back to Loki, Freya picked up her wine glass and said, And what is it to you? There are plenty of other blacksmith familia in Orario, are there not? Yeah, but we had a contract with Hephaestus. Just what the hell did you offer to break it? Loki looked at Hephaestus and said, and why didn't you say anything to me about it? Hephaestus crossed her arms and said, I don't answer to you, Loki. And it couldn't be helped. There was something important that I needed as well. TCH. Loki shook her head and then shifted in her seat, placing one arm over the backrest. Whatever. She snatched Hestia's glass and took a swig before pausing and said, The hell? Non-alcoholic. Hestia rolled her eyes and said, Unlike a certain drunkard, I don't need alcohol to have a good time. Manners are more than enough. Loki blinked and then snorted, setting the glass back on the table. You're getting wittier these days, shrimp. That have something to do with your sudden growth spurt. Hestia straightened and puffed up her chest. Unlike you old hag. I still have room to grow. TCH. Loki drained the glass and then stood up. Freya watched her and said, Is that all, Loki? Did you just come here to vent your frustrations by being rude? Loki glanced between Hestia and the other two goddesses before shaking her head. No. I was thinking that shrimp here got in over her head. But since it looks like you three are plotting something, I'll just leave it with that little temper tantrum. Although. She paused and then turned to look at Freya. As she did, Loki opened her eyes wide, staring Freya down with a sharp glare. Freya. Do you know anything about the variant monsters in the dungeon? Hestia tensed. Variant monsters? Did Loki know about Fina? Bell mentioned that he had registered being a monster tamer to a jackbird, so did that information come out somehow? Loki noticed Hestia's reaction and frowned. Hestia started to sweat and began to open her mouth to explain herself. And then Freya nodded and said, Of course. My otter and Hestia's beloved Bell are working together to hunt them down as we speak. Okay. Although Hestia still didn't like the fact that Freya was trying to squeeze her way into their family, she appreciated the support. Wait. Hestia stood up and said, Bell is hunting monsters with otter? In the dungeon? Since when? Freya raised an eyebrow and said, Since this morning? Did he not tell you? In fact, they should be. Well, knowing Otter's skills, I would hazard that they're on the thirteenth floor by now. Thirteenth. Okay. Hestia took it back. Freya was a menace. 
and if she really did have a child with Belle. Oh heavens! That child was going to turn Orario upside down from mischief. Triple X. Ugh. I wiped my mouth after finishing the last of the experimental potions Naza gave me. I'm getting sick of this damned orange gravy taste. Otter looked at me before giving an approving nod. Even so, it appears effective. You have already put on a fair bit of muscle from this training. I pushed myself to my feet and pulled out a stone spear from my inventory. I just hope that this is all the muscle I'm gonna get. Since rushing through the dungeon to the middle floors with Otter, I'd already had to recraft my clothes and equipment a few times to match my growing muscles. There wasn't a chance to check my growth yet, but considering that my biceps looked pretty massive from my point of view. Hey Otter. Yes, Belle. I stared at him and focused on his muscles before saying, I'm not as muscular as you right now, am I? Of course not. He gave me a faint smile and said, it would take some time for you to forge a body like mine. Particularly as you are human. Good. Because it would be awkward if I went back home as buff as you. Lean and mean was the name of the game. Especially for my fighting style. Being too bulky would be bad. Just like how the fake Super Sien 2 increased power but was much weaker since it was so slow and hard to maneuver in. Meaningless worries. Otter shook his head and then hefted his great sword. Now, shall we advance? I spun my spear around and nodded. Yeah. We're looking for an Almirage variant, right? Knowing my luck, we'll probably find one if we roam around here a bit, so dash. A soft plopping sound. Like something hopping around. I blinked and then slowly turned off to the side. There, a tiny white bunny with blue eyes peered out at me from behind a giant boulder. Q. All right. So being a Gary Stu can have its perks. I'll take it. Otter blinked and said, what is a Gary Stu? I put my spear away and held out my hands to the bunny. As I did, I turned my head towards Otter and said, a man of unfathomable and unfair power who the entire universe revolves around. A god, then. I'd say more than a god, but you can think of it like that. Anyway. I smiled at the bunny and said, Heya, bunny kun. Can you understand me? Q. The bunny nodded and then hopped over before jumping into my hands. The moment it did, the bunny nuzzled against me and let out more content cues. I laughed and turned towards Otter. Mission accomplished. Now, we just have to head back to Freya and see if this little guy will dash. I found you. A harsh and grating voice echoed in my head. At the same time, the dungeon started shaking. KQ. The bunny trembled and pressed itself closer towards me. You will not escape like the other. Um. I took a few steps back and glanced at Otter. Can you hear that, Otter? I can hear the sounds of the walls breaking, but nothing else. Otter raised his sword and said, What do you hear? Return to my embrace in. You. A whole boatload of trouble. Hey, uh, bunny cun. Hop inside my inventory for a bit. This is gonna get messy. Q. The bunny looked confused, but I didn't have time to explain. I opened my inventory and pushed it inside. The bunny let out a few surprised sounds, but then it let out a few happy sounds, paired with some munching noises. Munching noises? Hey. Don't eat the magic dash. It comes. Otter rushed in front of me and swung his sword. The moment he did, the sound of screeching steel echoed as a flaming silver vine was swatted to the side. Vine? Just as I was starting to process what happened, the wall in front of us collapsed. And in its place. A juggernaut. Otter frowned and said, this is unexpected. Silver flames roared to life within the gap formed by the collapsed wall. And when it did, our attacker's form was revealed. It wasn't a monster I recognized from reading the bestiaries in the guild library. However, it was one that any gamer would recognize, if not by name then by sight. A beautiful woman that appeared to be trapped within the center of a blossoming silver rose. Swirling vines all around that it used for a fence along with a perfect and bare body that was designed to distract adventurers enough to cut them down in that gap of attention. An Alron. One that Otter recognized as a juggernaut, and from what it had just said, a monster that had it out for me as much as Dungeon Chan did. And probably came around because of Dungeon Chan. I sighed and mentally primed a bombardment of weapons from my inventory. Staring at the monster, I shook my head and said, 
we have got to stop meeting like this, Dungeon Chan. Die, Anomaly. Chapter 44, Is It Wrong to Copy a Demon? A roiling mass of silver vines rushed towards me, all laced with crimson flames. Dangerous. Something that I couldn't face head on, especially by myself. But I wasn't alone, and I didn't have to face it either. Otter appeared before me again and then swung his sword, cleaving the vines and flames apart with a giant shockwave. When he did, he frowned and glanced back at me. Have you done something to earn the ire of the dungeon? I opened my teleport menu to try and make a quick escape. I, may have destroyed a good portion of the third floor a few days ago before leaving. And damn it! Of course teleporting would be jammed. Just like how you couldn't run away from a boss battle, my powers weren't letting me fast travel away. Was it because Dungeon Chan caught on the last time I managed to escape? Well, in either case, I had prepared for this scenario. Otter stood in front of me and raised his sword, calmly analyzing the Alron. I see. That would explain why a juggernaut emerged. The Alron growled and drew back its vines, shifting its, hers? Hers. The Alron shifted her glare onto Otter for the moment and raised her hand. As she did, crimson scales started to appear on her skin, along with a red haze around her body. I opened up my inventory, ignored the fact that Bunnykun was munching on the magic stones I had picked up speed running the place with Otter, and then tapped on a stack of glimmering swords that looked like they were carved from blue glass. You keep mentioning that. I kept a cautious eye on the Alron and surveyed our surroundings. What exactly is a juggernaut anyway? An unstoppable weapon of mass destruction. According to Lady Freya, it is the dungeon's defense mechanism. Something created to handle threats capable of causing extensive damage to the dungeon itself. I see. Note to self. Don't try to speedrun by punching through the floors. Dungeon Chan doesn't like being penetrated, apparently. Burn to a crisp. That harsh and grating voice echoed again. The moment it did, the Alron clenched her fist, sending out a surge of blistering flames. Otter frowned and started to swing his sword again. But before he could, I threw out my swords. The sound of shattering glass. The Alron instantly reacted to my actions and swung her vines even through the blistering flames. But I was expecting that. You see, after the disaster at the temple with Artemis, I started to expand my thinking. Since I was the MC. And since I was a Garys too, the world was being an asshole. Maybe due to power scaling, it was going out of its way to cause trouble for me at every turn. After all, what should have been a casual trip with Ryu to do some investigation turned into a freaking. So I decided. If the world was going to be BS, I was going to be BS right back at it. And so. Asterisk what? Asterisk. Reality is whatever I want it to be, Dungeon Chan. An explosion of blue water smothered the crimson flames. The moment that happened, a faint smile crossed Otter's face. How resourceful. I quickly crafted a boat from my inventory and jumped in. Compliment me later. We gotta get out of here first. I had aimed the water towards the Alron to try and push her back down that passageway. But it seemed like it wasn't as deep as I thought since a wave of water was crashing right back towards us. Kyaku. Bunny Kun sounded excited. Glad one of us was enjoying this at least. Not. Learn to read the room, kid. Otter glanced at the Alron for a moment, a thoughtful expression on his face. But then he hopped in the boat with me. Not a moment too soon. With a thunderous roar, the surge of water reached us, sweeping up the boat and sending us down the dungeon again. If it was any other person, it would have been a ridiculously uncontrollable trip right to David Jones' locker. But I was the MC, so that didn't happen. Using, I controlled the currents and guided us through the floor towards the stairs leading up. At the same time, I spread my awareness and did my best to avoid running into any other adventurers. At least, I tried to. But with how much water was here, the number of monsters still trying to attack us along the way, and a screaming Dungeon Chan possessing an Alron rushing through the waves with us like a bloodthirsty shark. Yet. Yeah. Let's hope that other people were luckier than I was when it came to the dungeon. Otherwise. Rib. Triple X. Surging tides. Monsters swept up by the water and then killed as they smashed against the walls. Thankfully, there weren't any adventurers along the way. Though, that might have been because Dungeon Chan was screaming bloody murder and making it blatantly obvious something was going on. 
I will have your head, Anomaly. See? But anyway, the surge of water eventually died down as we reached the stairs. At the same time, my boat shattered into grey dust, mixing with the water and turning it into grey slush. Unfortunately, fast travel was still locked since I was in a story cuts scene slash boss battle. It seems that escape is futile, Bell. Otter brushed himself off and raised his sword again. Glancing at me, he said, do you have any other plans? I brushed myself off and stared down the dark corridors. Since the water had thinned out, the Alron couldn't move as fast as before. Because of that, it was still a fair distance away. Enough to where Otter and I could make a break for it. Considering how pissed off Dungeon Chan seemed to be though, and since she was definitely possessing that monster with the malicious black mana rolling off that thing, I had a feeling that a lot of people would die in the process. Also that I'd somehow get pinned for it and have the Freya Familia dragged in as a result. Since that was the case. Yet. Yeah. I opened my inventory and said, kill the thing. Otter smiled. Yes. That is the bravery that Lady Freya's husband should possess. I swept my hand through the air and summoned more throwaway magic swords along with my giant stone shields. I'm not her husband, but otherwise, I agree. Gotta be at least that Balza considering a whole slew of level 5 and up Yandera adventurers from your familia are gonna try and off me in the near future. Otter nodded. Indeed. To survive, you will need to undergo many more trials in the future and gain the strength necessary to be Lady Freya's hero. I'm starting to hate how many flags keep being raised around me. Did I get a weird skill? Definitely needed to get a status update from Tia ASAP so that I can recalibrate my plans. But right now. Glittering crystal leaves cutting through the hall towards me. They were fast. Too fast for me to dodge. But. Asterisk you dare steal from me again? Asterisk. They were inanimate objects, which meant I could grab them. Thanks for the gift, Dungeon Chan. Let me pay you back. The leaves seemingly pierced into me, but instead flew into my inventory. And in response, I sent a barrage of glittering white swords. An explosion of chilly wind swept through the area, along with a wave of icy blue light. With it, the Alron was trapped inside a wall of ice that spread from the floor to the ceiling. But barely a second after it appeared, the wall of ice started cracking. Of course. A monster being directly inhabited by Dungeon Chan wouldn't be stopped by the cheap and mass-produced magic swords I made from low-ranked magic stones. But it bought time. Enough for Otter to act. A crimson blur streaked across the floor. Shortly after, the sound of shattering glass echoed as Otter's sword cleaved through the ice wall and towards the Alron. A clean slash. Something that would easily split apart the monster. Or so it would appear. But instead of easily bisecting the Alron, Otter's sword bounced off and he was forced back a few steps. And the reason? Asterisk Boaz Warrior. You believe that piddling strength is enough, Asterisk. The Alron crossed her arms across her chest leaning back and looking down on Otter like a typical villainous. Black and red scales covered her body while the silver petals around her had turned into crystal, shimmering with iridescent light. Otter stabilized his stance and then narrowed his eyes. The infant dragon's flames, a combination of the hard-armored, wyvern, and crystal mantis's defenses working in perfect harmony to be able to resist my attacks. He glanced back at me and said, with that information, do you have any countermeasures, Bell? Was he testing me? From the speed and strength that I had seen Otter use, he could easily beat the Alron. Not only that, but he hadn't even tapped into any of his skills or magic. If he did, Dungeon Chan would be blown away and probably throw a temper tantrum. Still, other than pouting, that'd be it. I couldn't accurately gauge Otter's power because of how much he dwarfed me in terms of mana, but I could tell that the Alron was weaker than him by a few magnitudes. And stronger than me by the same measure. Even so, Otter was leaving it to me. Almost like this was a game and he was acting as a hard carry to feed me the kill. In that case. Q. A curious sound from Bunny Kun. I carefully stared at the Alron who was starting to emit a toxic looking purple mist. A juggernaut carries the traits of the monsters on the floor it emerges. However, as the self-defense mechanism of the dungeon, it vastly exceeds any ordinary monster where it emerges. Still, it is designed to disintegrate after a certain time period. Information filling my mind. A phenomenon that hadn't occurred for a while now. Was it from fast deductions? 
my subconscious processing loads of information through? I didn't know, but I wasn't about to question it. Instead. Even so, surviving until it disappears is unrealistic. Juggernauts do not possess magic stones. As executors of the dungeon's will, they are instead infused with magic and persist until that magic is exhausted. Right. That made sense. A monster meant to act as a reaper wouldn't have such an obvious weakness. Just like those foes in Etrian Odyssey, it wasn't meant to be something you beat at the level you find it. So this should be a dead end. As a level 1, I couldn't even think of beating it with my stats. Yet. I grinned and said, not right now. But this is the perfect opportunity to test things out for the future, isn't it? As expected of being an MC, I was being handed a tutorial on how to beat such enemies on a silver platter. Perish. The Alron swept its arms out, sending the toxic mist towards us. Unfortunately. Sorry, Dungeon Chan. But things like that don't work on me. And now, my turn. I held my hand out to the side and opened up my crafting menu. A simple sword wouldn't work. Magic didn't either considering that chucking those exploding magic swords earlier didn't phase the Alron. And since Otter's attacks were deflected, I definitely wouldn't be able to do any damage with my attacks since I was magnitudes weaker than the Boaz warrior. So. Something that ignored physical attacks. Something that wasn't magical in nature and could strike directly at the root with true damage. My cute daughter's ring fit the bill with her half-divine flames, but I didn't want to use that trump card more than I had to. Fortunately, I had recently picked up something else that might. The juggernaut takes some time to shift between different monster move sets. In that gap, you have an opportunity. Thanks for the confirmation mysterious voice in my head. But I'm going to grill you later, so prepare yourself. Anyway. Prepare yourself, Dungeon Chan. Crimson light flickered around me as I drew out the killing intent from the Freya Familia members that I stored earlier. I stomped the ground and raised my fists. Die 1000 deaths. Asterisk what? Asterisk. Metsu. An explosion. Parts of my clothes and armor shredding apart as their durability failed. Other parts reinforced as the murderous aura laced through my body. And then. Not enough, hi. I clicked my tongue and stared at the damaged Alron in front of me. Blood stained her cheek and her lower body was enveloped in violet petals as she tried to reform it from my strike. I did damage, but it wasn't enough to finish her off. Still. Asterisk I will remember you, anomalous bastard. You will die a painful death asterisk. Leaving that cliched line, she vanished, dissolving in a flurry of violet petals. Not how I expected the battle to go, but we take those. Chapter 45, Is It Wrong to Suspect a Friend? That bell. What has he gotten himself into this time? Inna let out a deep sigh and started glanced towards the stairs from a table she had commandeered on the first floor of Babel. Miss Ha stared at her fingernails before looking up at Inna and said, Is it that big a deal, Inna? Inna turned to glare at Miss Ha and said, It is. Do you know how many adventurers requested information about him from me today? Miss Ha adjusted her pink hair and said, Oh. Is that why you were so busy? I thought that was because you were getting more books for Mr. Cranel. Inna took off her glasses and rubbed her eyes. Ugh. Don't remind me about that. I still haven't finished finding a proper book on magic for him. I even asked Lady Riveria as a favor, but apparently Goddess Loki intervened and stopped her and said she wouldn't allow it unless I gave up info about Belle. And then separate from her, the Sword Princess herself came by to ask about Belle too. That sounds rough. Inna ran her hand through her hair and said, Damn it, Belle. Why is it that every time I go a day without hearing from him, it's even more chaotic? And every time I see him he's done something even more ridiculous. Miss Hill looked around at the empty lobby and said, Is that why you're waiting here in the middle of the night for him? Yes. Inna crossed her arms and said, At this rate, who knows what other crazy stunt he'll have pulled. I shouldn't be hearing about all these things like Belle walking up to the Freya Familia, winning in a spar against the Sword Princess, and winning over a Crosso to his Familia second hand. Uh huh. Miss Ha nodded and then glanced past Inna towards the stairs leading into the dungeon. Well. Either way, you might want to take a deep breath before turning around, Inna. Hi. Inna blinked and turned around. What are you? A towering figure wearing grey armor trimmed with crimson. 
form-fitting black clothes, hulking muscles that didn't fit his attractive face, creating a weird dichotomy. But from that white hair and those crimson eyes. Bell. The hulking warrior no, Bell flinched, sweat pouring down his face. With a faint blush, he gave Inna a small wave and said, H hey uh, Inna. Nothing big happened this time, promise. Another towering figure walked out from the stairs. Otter. Hearing Bell's words, the Boaz warrior chuckled and said, to say defeating a juggernaut is nothing big. He looked at Bell with sparkling eyes and said, I look forward to your continued growth, Bell. You did what? Bell groaned. Triple X. Back at the Ganesha Familia mansion, the banquet was finally winding down as the night drew long. Gods and goddesses alike were making their exit after enjoying their fill of the night's pleasantries. But Hestia, Freya, and Hephaestus remained. Hestia sipped on a glass of fruit punch, looking down from the balcony at the thinning crowd and said, Are you sure we should keep waiting, Freya? She looked to her side at Freya and said, It's getting kind of late. Freya sipped on a glass of wine and nodded. Mm. We could leave now. But in doing so, a few of the more annoying gods might see it as a weakness and start poking at us to see if there's any substance to our confidence. She paused and said, or rather, to your confidence, Tia. Ugh. Hestia leaned back in her chair and said, I hate politics. Hephaestus sighed while nursing a mug of cider. Me too, Tia. If only the other gods would just keep to themselves. Freya smiled and said, yes. But if gods could, we would not be here right now, would we? True. Hephaestus sighed again and then leaned back in her chair, gazing out at the crowd below. She sipped on her cider and frowned, looking around the area. But did Ganesha leave already? Hmm. Hestia looked down as well and said, Ganesha? Leave the banquet he's hosting. Yet. Yeah. I don't see him. Hephaestus frowned. Ganesha is currently preoccupied speaking with Ishtar at the moment. A calm and refined male voice called out. Freya paused in the middle of sipping her drink and set her cup down. Dionysus. The speaker smiled and gave a short bow. Lady Freya. It's not often we meet. A man with medium-length blonde hair and emerald eyes. Beautiful features and a delicate smile. He wore a violet suit with white cravat topped by a crystal brooch. Paired with matching pants and shoes, he gave off the impression of a perfect gentleman. Dionysus, a god of wine that rivaled Soma. Hephaestus smiled at Dionysus and said, Dio. I thought I recognized some of your work around. Did Ganesha ask you to help with the banquet? Dionysus let out a light laugh and said, Nothing much. I just gave a few bottles and kegs. It's hard to compete with Soma these days. Mm. Hephaestus nodded and said, True. She pursed her lips and said, I feel a bit sorry for those kids though. While Hephaestus made some small talk with Dionysus, Hestia frowned and stared at him. It was weird. Dionysus had always been nice back in heaven. And to Hestia, he had always treated her like a younger sister. Kind and caring. But she always felt like he was a bit weird. And now that she had seen him again after he spent time here in the lower realm, she was certain of it. Something was off with Dionysus. He wasn't lying about anything. And that kindness and refined appearance was real. But. Is something the matter, Hestia? Dionysus caught Hestia's gaze and let out a soft smile. Is it something on my face? Hestia blinked and then smiled back. It's nothing, Dio. Yes. It was nothing. It was probably nothing. Hestia was on edge after all, so she was probably imagining it. At least that was what she would have thought if she didn't see Freya's sharp gaze on him. Dionysus kept smiling and said, Well then, ladies. He bowed and said, I will leave you to relax for the night. Farewell. With those words and a small wave, Dionysus left. Hephaestus shook her head and said, He's the same as always, leaving after some small talk. Is he though? Hestia muttered and stared after Dionysus. And then she paused, realizing what was odd about Dionysus. Hey, Fafi. Yeah, Tia. Hestia frowned and stared at the crystal brooch that was still shining as Dionysus walked away. Has Dio always worn a crystal brooch? It was familiar. Something about the way that white light flickered inside the brooch. Hmm. Hephaestus followed Hestia's gaze and then said, 
Oh, that. Dio's always been wearing different accessories since arriving in the lower realm. He's pretty fashionable, actually. Freya set her glass aside, giving Dionysus a sidelong glance as he walked away. Is that so? Hestia's frown deepened. But then she shook her head. Even if it was weird, Dionysus wasn't the sort of person who would cause them trouble. Hestia had a feeling that wasn't true for everyone else, but she didn't feel like Dionysus was directing any ill will or malice towards her, so she'd leave it be for now. Instead, she focused on what Dionysus said. Did Dio say that Ganesha is talking with Ishtar? Freya nodded. He did indeed. She glanced down at the balcony and said, and it seems that I should have a talk with our host as well. Just to confirm something. Hephaestus glanced at Freya and frowned. Do you need us to come along? No need. Freya smiled and said, you two can go ahead. Especially you, Hephaestus. I believe Wealth and Pira would enjoy seeing you like that. Hephaestus pursed her lips, looking troubled. I should really get back to work. Since Loki's job was set aside because I made the children work on my own project dash. Hestia grabbed Hephaestus's arm. Hephaestus flinched and said, Titia. Fafi. You aren't seriously going to make me walk back home by myself, are you? It was an excuse. But even so, Hestia wasn't going to budge. Hephaestus seemed to realize that as she let out a tired smile and said, Fine. I can at least walk you back. Freya chuckled and said, Stay safe then. And try not to get into trouble along the way. Heaven knows that Orario would burn at the hands of your men if anything happened to you too. Hephaestus blushed and said, T that's not true. Wealth wouldn't dash. You have clearly not spent enough time catching up with wealth these days, Fafi. But anyway. Hestia waved at Freya and said, Talk to you later, Freya. You stay safe too. Oh I'm sure I'll be fine. Freya laughed and said, While I would adore having Bell run to my side, I'm quite capable of protecting myself. With that, Freya waved and walked down the stairs. Hestia kept a firm grip on Hephaestus's arm and led her towards the other stairs leading to the exit. Let's go, Fafi. Now to see how happy Wealth and Pira can get from seeing Hephaestus all dolled up. Hestia couldn't wait. Chapter 46, Is It Wrong to Get Some Milk? Oh my! Freya let out a soft smile as she walked into her room and said, I didn't expect you to wait for me here, Belle. She laughed and said, Tia will be jealous. I added Freya's room in Babel to my fast travel list and then shook my head. I have to hold up my end of the bargain, don't I? After finagling my way out of that mess with Inna, and remembering to get her a proper gift to apologize as well as explain everything going on at a later point, I had Otter lead me to Freya's room to wait for her. Not before I sent a quick note back home to explain that I'd be a bit longer, of course. Freya closed the door behind her and walked over, her silver hair shifting over her form-fitting black dress. As she got closer, she gave me a once-over and chuckled. I see Otter has been giving you quite a bit of training for you to come back looking like that. I reflexively rubbed my arms and sighed. More like Naz's training potions are too effective. That plus the fact that using raw killing intent against a monster shredded all your muscles equaled me being obscenely buff. Like complete strongman bodybuilder type. I know I made a lot of cracks about Zenkai's before, but this is a bit much. Seriously. I hadn't even figured out Super Sion yet, you know? What's with this random fake Super Sion 2 build? What am I, Broly? Wait. That would be... No, no, no. Power isn't everything, Belle. And even if I could become a lightning bruiser, normal life becomes more awkward. Much better to just keep it as a temp power boost. Which reminds me. Note to self, see if Naza can figure out a muscle compression pill or something. Freya walked over to sit down by a table near her window and then gestured to the seat across from her. Please, sit down, Belle. There's no need to be so uptight here. She let out a soft smile again and said, My home is your home. You see. That's the creepy part. I frowned and hesitantly walked over to sit across from her. You're seriously acting like a crazy woman, you know. Freya giggled and then placed her hands on her cheeks, staring into my eyes. Well then, are you going to take responsibility? You're the one who caused this, you know. Absolutely not. To both questions. But anyway. 
I opened my inventory and said, Bunny Kun. Can you come out for a bit? Q. The bunny hopped out and then landed on the table. Looking around with its wide blue eyes, the bunny's ears twitched and it let out some happy squeaks. Oh wait, that was Freya. By the heavens, you're adorable. Before I could react, Freya had swiped Bunny Kun from the table and hugged it against her chest. I blinked and said, You um, Freya dash. Q you the bunny let out a happy and content sound before snuggling against Freya. So you're the one who will become our child? Oh, I can't even imagine how precious you will be when you change. Freya let out an extremely out of character motherly smile and said, Mommy will give you everything you want. Kya Q. I glanced between Bunny Kun and Freya and said, So. I guess both of you are fine with it. Bunny Kun. The bunny looked at me and nodded. Kya Q. Just for the record, you're going to change from what you are now into a different form and become the kid of me and that crazy lady there. Are you fine with that? Kya Q. A quick and eager nod along with a bright sparkle in the bunny's blue eyes. A sparkle matched by Freya in her violet eyes. I wonder if the bunny cun got hit with Freya's charm. I knew that I was immune, but other people apparently weren't. And that made me think of a whole slew of other ethical and moral dilemmas that came with using a sentient being as a base to create essentially a chimera biological child with a woman who I reluctantly respected, but definitely didn't love. Still. Well, in for a penny, in for a pound, I guess. I mumbled and said, did you manage to get Dash? Before I could even finish, Freya placed a sparkling crystal vial on the table in front of me. I didn't know what was inside of it, but I could definitely tell that it had Freya's mana. I also didn't particularly want to know what was inside the vial, so maybe that was probably for the best. Q. Bunny Kun turned around to look at me again. Freya smiled and said, so. She licked her lip and said, you mentioned a pound. Does that mean that dash? No horny. I plucked Bunny Kun away from Freya and then picked up the vial. Freya laughed and then tilted her head to the side. Did you hear that, horny? This is my child, not yours. Aeon Freya was definitely crazy. Still, having a kid would, probably mellow her out a bit more. At the least, it would definitely lock in her role as our ally, if only because she'd be my baby mama. Ugh. There could be worse things. I guess so, mysterious voice in my head who's also different from the one that tells me useful combat info. I shook my head and focused. There were all sorts of flags that had just been raised, but I could focus on them later. Right now, new family edition. Let's see. Bunny Kun ate enough magic stones while chilling in my inventory, so there was enough mana to work with there to start off with. In that case, I guess I just needed to start the process. Apologies in advance. Bunny Kun. But your pop is an unreasonable person and your mama here is crazy, so. A surge of mana. Drawing out traces of Freya's divinity, the ambient mana, and my own mana to fuel the process. Focusing on the magic stone inside of Bunny Kun. Envisioning the necessary systems just like I did for Fina. And. Triple X. How do I look, mama? A beautiful young girl with crimson eyes turned to the side holding up the hems of a pristine white dress. Her hair, a pure white color tinged purple at the edges, shifted as she did, along with the black hair ribbon she wore. Freya resisted the urge to scream in happiness. Barely. Instead, she let out a wide smile and said, You look beautiful, Bella. The young girl, Bellatrix, let out a shy smile and said, Am I as pretty as Mama? That time, Freya couldn't resist. She let out a happy scream and then dashed over to pull her daughter into a hug. Prettier. Absolutely prettier. Hee <laughs> hee. That's not fair, Freya. I want to be called Mama too. Humph. Freya picked up her daughter and then walked over to sit at her usual spot beside the window in her room. Placing Bellatrix on her lap, Freya casually patted her daughter's head before saying, You can have a child with Bell the normal way, horny. But... Freya forcibly stopped the connection with Horn before shifting her attention back on Bellatrix. Now, is there anything Mama can do for her cute little girl? Bellatrix tilted her head, idly tapping her index finger on her chin. After a bit, she looked up at Freya and said, Can we go see Papa and my big sister? Freya paused. Bellatrix's eyes started watering. I is it no good? Of course we can. 
but I think Mama will need a disguise. Bellatrix blinked and said, Is it because Mama is so pretty? Kaaaaa. Freya stood up and swung Bellatrix around. You're such a cutie, Bella. Bellatrix giggled and said, Mama's cute too. And this is fun. We. Triple X. Staring at Freya and her new daughter from his spot on the shelf, the disembodied soul of Zald let out a mental sigh. It seems that karma comes back in strange ways, doesn't it, Alfia? The child that she had carried for her sister while swallowing her disgust and pride. The sin she thought she could atone for by doing that. That child had not only come back to Orario instead of living peacefully far from it, but he had even started having children of his own. And now there was even one born not out of love, but of obligation. What would you think if you could see him now, Alfia? Zald wondered. Would she be furious that the child was as popular with woman as that hateful bastard? Proud that the child had inherited her talents? Sad that he was nothing like Meteria and more like Alfia? Either way. Zald shifted his attention towards the window, focusing on the growing crowd as well as the monsters being brought in from outside Orario and from the dungeon. It looks like Orario will have its hero, sooner rather than later, Erebus. Triple X. I drained a giant glass of beer and then slammed it on the table. Damn it. Why is my life like this? Welf raised an eyebrow and said, because you're a ridiculous bastard who even the heavens probably envy. I held my mug over my head and said, another. A private booth in the back corner of the Hostess of Fertility. After becoming a father yet again, I ran away from Freya to pick up some milk. I mean, I headed back home, kissed Tia good morning, hugged Fina said hello to Artemis and Pira, and then dragged both Ryu and Welf off with me to the Hostess of Fertility. Because goddammit I needed a drink. A soft sigh echoed and Ryu walked over with another glass filled with beer. It is far too early to be drinking this much, Belle. I grabbed the offered mug from her and took a long swig. After that, I said, just let me relax for a bit, okay? I just dash. Before I could finish my sentence, someone slipped into the seat across from me chugging their own glass of beer. A familiar someone. Seer slammed her mug on the table and then glared at me. That didn't make sense. Freya should be spoiling our cute daughter Bella. And that was a strange thought. But anyway, Freya should be spoiling Bella right now. So then who is? You're a terrible man, Belle. Making me feel like this but ignoring me and having a child with the one I admire with all my heart instead. I really, really really want to kill you. You know. Oh. Oh. So I hadn't been imagining things when I thought that Freya seemed to be in two places at once. And that Seer had been a normal person. It turns out that Seer was Freya's imaginary friend who shared a monolink with her. I sipped on my mead before hesitantly saying, well. Try not being horny. Seer growled and then started chugging her mead. Yep. Definitely the horny person that Freya was talking about. Hi. Good to know. This merits another drink. I pointedly ignored Seer and started draining my beer. Damned increased body mass. Why was it taking so much to get a buzz? Well face palmed. Well. I guess that's one way to try and get the ladies off you. Chapter 47, Is It Wrong to Procrastinate? Ryua glanced at Seer and frowned. I do not think that you should dash. Oh shut up, Ryuu. I'm pissed right now. Let me drink in silence. Ryuu flinched and stared at Seer in shock. And then she looked at me and that shock turned to understanding before shifting a bit to disappointment. I waved my glass at Ryuu and said, Hey. Don't misunderstand here. I didn't do anything to hurt Seer here. Welf let out a deep sigh and said, Could you grab me a drink too, Miss Ryuu? I think I'll need it. I think I will grab one for myself as well. Ryu aside and then walked towards the back of the kitchen. I sipped on my glass of beer and then took a look around. The hostess of fertility was surprisingly empty today. Outside definitely wasn't, but the only ones in the cafe slash diner slash tavern today was me, Welf, Ryu, Seer slash Horny slash Freya imposter, and Mia who was chilling in the back of the kitchen. I set my glass down and then looked at Seer. Where are the other girls today? Seer snorted. What? Looking to flirt with more women already. Welf shook his head and gave me a sidelong glance. Bro. How do you have this effect on women? 
I stole a bit of Freya's charm by accident. And no, I'm not. I eyed my glass of beer and shifted it to the side for the moment. It wasn't giving me a buzz anyway or doing anything to help this headache, so, yeah. Let's just ignore it. I looked back at Seer and said, I was just curious. There seems to be a lot going on today, so I was wondering if they were out doing something. I didn't know what was going on but I did notice a lot more people than usual on the streets this morning while I was taking Welf and Ryu over. And with how strong the other waitresses in the Hostess of Fertility were. Well, with how many flags I'd been raising, I would have liked to have a bit of information to work off. Ryu walked back with a tray filled with more glasses of beer as well as a big bottle of wine. Setting it down on the table, she handed Welf a glass and said, Anya, Chloe, and Lunoir are taking the day off to explore Monsterphilia. I blinked and then stuck my finger in my ear to clear it out. After that, I looked at Ryu and said, Come again? I think I didn't hear you right. Welf snorted and said, So you're a pervert after all, hi, hey, bro. I felt my face heat up, but I said, H hey. Anyone would misunderstand with that sort of name. Welf shook his head and grabbed his glass of beer. It's the big event hosted by the Ganesha Familia. A big festival to show off tamed monsters and everything. He sipped on his beer and said, I was planning to take Pira out to look around today, but someone dragged me out instead. Seer let out a long suffering sigh and muttered, I wanted to go on a date with Belkun today. She promised me I could. Let's ignore that comment for now. Anyway. I drained the rest of my beer and called. Mama Mia. Bring out the food. Welf blinked and said, Bro. What? I set my glass to the side and said, everything's set up for a big fight or monster breakout later, so I gotta stock up on energy, right? Right. You still haven't answered who you are, oh mysterious voice in my head. Thou art I, and I am thou. Go screw yourself. Triple X. Lily was having a bad day. The adventurer party she was leeching off had been wiped out in a freak accident the other night in the dungeon while she was stocking up on a supplies. Because of that, she had to go find a new one to go explore with, but since today was Monsterphilia, there weren't any adventurers going into the dungeon. Well, there were, but none that would accept a level 1 supporter like her. Then there was the fact that the next payments were due in a few weeks and Lily was short. Ha! Huh. Lily tugged the tattered edges of her hooded cloak a bit closer and muttered, as always, Lily has bad luck. Maybe she should draw some from her savings? But if she did that it would be clear that she was hiding funds from her familia. Captain Zanis was already suspecting that she was up to something, so... Miss. Miss. A cute young girl's voice echoed from nearby. Lily blinked and came to a stop, looking towards the speaker. As expected, it was a young girl. Long white hair, mismatched red and blue eyes, and a cute white and red dress. The girl was standing behind a small shop stall selling trinkets. There was another girl with her, one with short red hair, blue overalls, and also mismatched red and blue eyes, although the shades were a bit different. The second girl looked up at Lily and then shyly looked away immediately after. Supervising the two girls was a beautiful woman with long blue hair tied in a braided ponytail. Wearing a pure white dress, and with the serene aura around her, she seemed to be a goddess. Except, she didn't have the distinctive atmosphere that all gods had, so it seemed like she wasn't. Even so, that woman wasn't just some pretty face. Although she was smiling and acting all refined, Lily could tell that the woman was strong. Those emerald green eyes staring at Lily were definitely sizing Lily up. Miss. The first girl waved and said, I heard you say you had bad luck, right? My daddy has that a lot too, so this should help you. After saying that, the white-haired young girl held out a small box to Lily. Lily blinked and slowly walked over. Um. Lily was just talking to herself. The young girl nodded and said, Daddy does that too. She smiled and said, So Miss should definitely take this. Since you're like Daddy, it should help a lot. A pure and innocent expression. Nothing but goodwill and happiness. Lily didn't want to be a bother to someone like that or get her wrapped up in any trouble, so she considered just walking away. But then she got a closer look at the trinkets on the table. They were haphazardly made items. Misshapen rings, clumsily woven cloth bracelets, the sort of crafts you would expect from children. But the materials those trinkets were made from. Lily wasn't an appraiser, 
but she had a good eye. That ring there, it was made from dir adamantite. And that little marble, it was definitely oracleum. The shimmering pendant there, wasn't that a blood onyx? Lily gulped at the sudden realization that what she dismissed as pile of trinkets were probably worth more than what she had made in the past six months risking her life. And as she had that realization, she had a sudden urge to test her luck. Only to feel a sharp gaze on her. That woman with light blue hair. Lily looked over to see the woman smiling at her. A casual, genial smile. And the woman was standing casually as well, arms crossed and patiently waiting. But Lily could see it. A faint gleam of a barely visible crystal arrow pointed at Lily's head. Something out of eyesight for the two young girls, but one that anybody in front of them could see. Miss. The first young girl tilted her head, confused. Do you, not want it? Lily shook her head and smiled. Lily will take it. Thank you. Great. The young girl handed the box over and let out a bright smile. Then, be safe. Oh. And if you need a party to go in the dungeon, I think Daddy is looking for more people soon. So if you're still lonely, come back here tomorrow and I'll introduce you, okay? Lily eyed the blue-haired woman before giving a slow nod. Lily will think of it. Thank you. With that, she made a quick retreat, mixing back in with the crowd. Wait. Lily hadn't noticed it since it was so sudden and strange, but now that she thought about it, wasn't it weird that it had been so quiet around that stall? The girls were cute, the trinkets were incredible, and that woman was divine beauty in mortal form, so there should have been more of a commotion. Just to check, Lily glanced back only to see that there wasn't a stall there at all. Where the girls had been, only a blank wall was. No. If she watched the crowd closely, the people were subtly moving around it, politely nudged out of the way of where the stall should be. Lily immediately looked away and kept walking. Don't think too deep about it, Lily. She gulped and then resisted the urge to tremble. Trouble. That was definitely trouble. She didn't know if those two were really kids, but if they were, then they were the kids of some incredible adventurers that Lily didn't want to get involved with. What did she give Lily anyway? She was still holding the box, so it was definitely real. But. Lily stared at the box, hesitating. Should I open it? Her mind was telling her it was trouble but her intuition said it was money. And weighing the two. It shouldn't be that dangerous. Lily decided to open the box. And when she did. At. Eh. Fina's delivery service, activated. A cute voice echoed in Lily's head. But not just that. The moment the voice finished talking, something else appeared. A flurry of glowing messages floating in thin air, along with a transparent store shelf. Being an adventurer is dangerous. So my friend Pira and I made a useful store. As long as you have the ring, you can use our shop wherever you are, even in the dungeon. We don't have a lot yet, but we're working hard to practice and make useful things. Here's what we have right now and our prices. Blocky silver ring, 100 valis. Pointy hot sword, 1000 valis. Pretty auntie's healing potion, 250 valis. Glittery bang swoosh ring, 100 valis. Am I dreaming? Lily tilted her head and muttered, Lily must be dreaming. Something like this can't be real, can it? Triple X. Wow. Fina tapped at the glowing window in front of her and said, Miss Lily's buying a lot already. Pira leaned over and said, I is she? Then, did we make something good? MMHM. Fina nodded and said, It's just like that blonde mister said. People really like convenient things. And magic is really convenient. Now. Fina reached into thin air, her arm vanishing for a moment before popping back with a small bag of coins. We have spending money. She turned towards Artemis and said, Can we go shopping now, Auntie Artemis? There aren't many customers anyway, right? Artemis smiled, subtly adjusting the invisible barrier repelling people around the girl's tiny shop stall. Just a bit longer. Your mother should be here soon. Sweetie. Hestia smiled as she walked over, carrying an armful of crepes. Did you sell anything? Fina nodded and held up her bag of coins. MMHM. A lonely big sister bought a lot from us, so we can pay rent. Hestia's smile froze and then she let out a deep sigh. Damn it, Belle. Stop teaching our kid weird things. 
What weird things, mommy? Nothing, sweetie. Hestia patted Fina's head before looking at Pira and Artemis. Smiling again, she said, Now then, let's go have fun at Monsterphilia. Triple X. In the sewers beneath Orario, a masked man held up a vial of glittering orange liquid. Inayo tilted his head and said, It's a pity that Freya realized the charm Ishtar placed on Ganesha, but this should still work. He tilted the vial to the side, causing a tiny white jewel with what looked like a fetus inside of it to become visible from within the liquid. I'll have to have Philvis suggest it to that alchemist later to make things more interesting. But for her now. Inayo tossed the vial into the sewer water, watching as it shattered, the contents completely dissolving away into the sewage. Beneath his mask, Inayo grinned and said, now to just wait as the seeds of the first orgia sprout. Triple X. I paused in the middle of chomping down on a foot-long sandwich. Welf looked over at me and said, something wrong, bro. Yes. I took the bite from my sandwich and chewed it before swallowing. After that, I frowned and said, and I don't know what. You haven't gone out of your way to make anything crazy recently, have you? No. Hmm. I set my sandwich down and said, then why do I feel like someone I know just opened Pandora's box? Triple X. Achoo. Fina sniffed and then wiped her nose. Hestia frowned and said, are you okay, sweetie? MMHM. Fina nodded and said, I'm fine, mommy. I think daddy's just talking about me oh. It's Auntie Freya. Hi Auntie. My. What a coincidence. Freya made her way through the crowd, tugging along a small figure behind her. One who made Hestia freeze in place. Bellatrix peeked out from behind Freya and gave a shy wave. H hi. Triple X. Ryu. Pour me another. Ryu tilted her head and said, that is your tenth one, Belle. And I'm feeling that I'll need a dozen more to deal with whatever the day's throwing at me, so if you would be so kind. Chapter 48, It Was Wrong to Innovate Freya glanced off to the side and smiled. It looks like the children are getting along well. Hestia glanced over as well, doing her best not to frown. Since the streets were getting a bit more crowded, and since Freya was Freya, even while hiding her beauty beneath a hooded robe, the group had moved over to a more private location. That was a bit difficult to do considering Monsterphilia was happening and tourists, both adventurers and not, were pouring into Orario. Fortunately, the owner of the bookstore that let Hestia use it for Belle's first status update allowed them to borrow the place since he was heading out to look around. And right now, Hestia, Freya, and Artemis were sitting at a table with some tea and biscuits watching the kids sitting on the carpet between the bookshelves and reading stories to each other. Well, Fina was reading. It seemed like Welf hadn't taught Pira how to read yet and Freya's daughter didn't know because she was just born. And that was a thought. Freya's daughter. Not just Freya's daughter, but Freya and Belle's daughter. Her Belle. Not Freya's Belle, but Hestia's. And it was done in a perfectly wholesome manner. Nothing lewd. Hestia knew that. The one that Belle loved was absolutely her and no one else. He tolerated Freya and drew other beautiful women around him, but he only had eyes for Hestia. Her. So why did this still feel like an annoying thorn in her heart? Something bittersweet she was forced to taste? Tia. Freya tilted her head, staring out at Hestia from beneath her hood. Is something wrong? Hestia stared back and then forced herself to set aside her unease. If it was anyone else, Hestia wouldn't have held back. And if Freya was reacting with any other expression, Hestia would have said something, even with the children nearby. But seeing Freya with that genuinely satisfied and motherly expression, the warm and content gaze that she gave towards Bellatrix and had to consciously draw back to look at Hestia. And contrasting that expression with the aloof and ethereal appearance that Hestia remembered of Freya from the few times they met in heaven. Hestia let out a deep sigh and then put on a weary smile. You're right. I'm glad that they're getting along well. That was the most important part. Even if they had different mothers, Fina and Bellatrix had the same father. They were sisters, whether Hestia was comfortable with that fact or not. Family, and not just familia. Because of that. Hestia couldn't be too selfish. Freya stared at Hestia and then lowered her gaze. Sorry. I didn't know it would upset you this much. Hestia blinked and then quickly waved her hand. Oh, no. It's fine. 
She glanced back at the children and then placed her hand over her slightly aching heart before mumbling, I didn't think it would either. If it is any consolation, Belle and I haven't done anything. And also. Freya let out a weary smile of her own and said, his heart is very much still focused on you and Fina. A strange mix of emotions. Happiness at hearing that from Freya and on seeing that weary smile. And then guilt for the same reasons. Hestia pursed her lips, wondering what to say. But before she could, Freya changed the topic. Looking towards Artemis, Freya smiled and said, I don't believe we've properly been introduced. She held out her hand and said, Freya, Tia's friend. Artemis shifted her gaze away from the children and then nodded, shaking Freya's hand. Tia says that I'm Artemis, and I, feel that is true. But even so, I'm not the goddess, even if it might appear that way. Hestia frowned and said, Artemis dash. Artemis let go of Freya's hand and looked to Hestia. It's fine, Tia. She looked back at the children and said, Not being able to remember my past is a bit melancholic, and being with you and your familia makes me feel an ache in my chest at something I can't recall. But. She tilted her head, a strange expression on her face. I feel like the people I used to know would support me in being happy like this. That definitely wasn't fine. Is what Hestia wanted to say to Artemis. But seeing that expression, just like with Freya, Hestia was at a loss for words. But it seemed Freya wasn't. Letting out a bright smile, Freya nodded and said, Artie, then. It's a pleasure to meet you. Artemis blinked. Artie. Freya reached out to pour some tea for everyone and said, Artemis is a bit too formal and some people might get confused. With that hairstyle too, certain people might not believe it when you say you aren't the goddess Artemis. She glanced at Hestia and said, Wouldn't you agree, Tia? Of course, the fact that Artie undoubtedly has your blessing will make people hesitate, but when enough oddities pile together, even idiots will start to believe. Hestia sighed. Especially with how ridiculous Belle is. Right. Artemis glanced between Freya and Hestia and tilted her head. Pardon. Freya reached up to tap her chin with her right index finger before saying, Well. Since we're all family here in one way or another, how about we have a bit of fun and do makeovers? She reached into her cloak and started pulling out various bottles, brushes, and containers. I was planning to use this to doll up the children, but I think we could have some fun for ourselves too. She paused and said, it'd be best if Fafi could be here too, but I suppose that serious woman is too busy managing her family business right now. Hestia sighed. You're probably right. She reached out to grab a cup of tea and said, we need to work on that. After Dinatus, Tia. But for her now. Freya grabbed a small bottle and said, shall we dress up a bit? Triple X. Hephaestus was not having a good day. To be honest, her past few days had not been good. Not because the Hephaestus familia had any issues. Business was booming and there were even a few new prospects applying to the Hephaestus familia. No. The problem was with Hephaestus. Specifically, her decision regarding her family. Not familia, but family. Out of habit, one formed recently, Hephaestus placed her left hand over the hilt of and felt the soft warmth radiating from it. When she did, she immediately felt a sense of happiness and fulfillment. And then that was promptly followed by crushing guilt and doubt. Maybe Freya is right. Welf was willing to throw everything on the line for her sake. Not only that, but Pira showed her unconditional love, even as Hephaestus was keeping up the ambiguous relationship between them. Shouldn't she at least? What is that goddess right about, Lady Hephaestus? Hephaestus flinched, suddenly drawn out of her thoughts. When she was, she realized her surroundings. Monster philia was happening. Because of that, and because there had been a rush of new materials due to the Loki familia clearing out the dungeon anomalies recently, the Hephaestus familia was hard at work both creating new equipment and repairing them. Enough that Hephaestus had been concerned things might get out of hand, so she wanted to take a look around for herself. But while she had been concerned about that, it seemed like she was more concerned about something else. Hephaestus shook her head and looked towards the person who spoke up. A woman with tan skin, crimson eyes with one covered by an eye patch, a bare torso with only tight white wrappings keeping her modest, and a red oriental garment for her lower body, paired with sandals. Tsubaki Kalbrand, 
the captain of the Hephaestus Familia, and the one who Hephaestus asked to serve as an escort for the Czech UPS. Tsubaki grinned and said, You thinking about that kid again? She paused and said, No, I guess he's a man now. I mean, he manned up enough to make you dash. Shush. Hephaestus quickly interrupted and took a quick look around. She ignored how her face was heating up and said, Not too loud. Tsubaki laughed and said, Is it really that bad, Lady Hephaestus? She glanced towards and said, I don't know how he pulled it off, but if he can make something like that, there isn't a smith in this world who wouldn't acknowledge him. Hell, if he came to me with that, I'd take him on the spot. Hephaestus glared at Tsubaki. Tsubaki smiled back and said, What? Don't you think we could make something great together? The child of two master smiths would be incredible, wouldn't they? Hephaestus paused, thinking about Pyrrha and her ability before sighing. She really would. She, hi. Hephaestus froze, realizing her slip up. Tsubaki laughed again. Hephaestus clicked her tongue and then started walking again, mixing in with the crowd filling the streets of Orario. Tsubaki easily followed after Hephaestus and said, Did I say something wrong? Hephaestus crossed her arms and said, You've been acting up a bit too much recently, Tsubaki. Tsubaki smiled and said, I can't help it, Lady Hephaestus. You've just been too adorable recently. Adorable. Hephaestus blinked and then pointed at herself. Me. MMHM. Tsubaki laced her hands behind her head and said, You've always been a strict and hard-working goddess. Composed and serene, just like the beautiful blades you make. But now. She glanced at Hephaestus and smiled. You're really different. A little shy a little hesitant, and so romantic too. Are romantic. Well, yet. Yeah. Tsubaki pointed to and said, although it's a great blade, even I wouldn't openly wear something like that around, you know? Not only that, but the way you talk about wealthy and the look in your eyes. She chuckled and said, if I didn't know any better, I might think our goddess was replaced by a fake, you know. Hephaestus pursed her lips. She thought she had been keeping it in check, but if it was like that, Hephaestus felt a heavy pat on her shoulder. Tsubaki, reaching out to do that. Relax, Lady Hephaestus. Tsubaki let out a warm smile and said, You've worked hard for long enough. I don't think anyone will complain about you being a bit selfish after all you've done. Hephaestus came to a stop and hesitantly looked at Tsubaki. Really? Tsubaki thumped her chest and said, As the captain of the Hephaestus Familia, I can promise it. And if anyone disagrees, she reached out to tap a newly forged katana she had sheathed at her side. Well, I've been wanting to try out the new blade I made from seeing Welfi's work. Hephaestus blinked and then cautiously said, You haven't met Belle yet, have you? Tsubaki blinked. Belle? Who's that? Nobody. Nothing. Hephaestus stammered and said, F forget I said anything. With that, she quickly started walking away. Tsubaki jogged after her and said, you can't leave it like that, Lady Hephaestus. Someone who you personally acknowledged, is he a secret master smith? A promising recruit. Hephaestus felt her face heat up, but she ignored it. Turning back, she said, I already told you, it's Dash. Bang. Nothing. Hephaestus finished and then blankly turned back around. An explosion of debris. People screaming and running all over. Buildings being broken down by silver vines piercing up through the ground. A few adventurers running forward to try and stop it but getting split in half by flashing silver. And silver that was rushing towards her. Fay. A voice calling out to her no. That was her imagination. Gold flashed and met the silver, splitting it in half. At the same time, another voice called out to her. Subakis. Lady Hephaestus. She quickly moved in front of Hephaestus and said, I'll protect her. Tsubaki paused and stared at Hephaestus's sword. I thought that wasn't a magic sword, Lady Hephaestus. Hephaestus stared at the glowing gold blade that was clearly being filled with mana and muttered, I thought it wasn't either. But before either of the two women could think about it, more screams cut through the air as monsters went into a frenzy and broke free from their cages. Tsubaki focused and moved close to Hephaestus. Can you fight? Lady Hephaestus. Hephaestus raised her sword, feeling strength flowing through her as well as, technique? No, not just technique, 
but a familiar voice echoing in her head, paired with the sound of clanging steel. Spirit and technique, flawless and firm. Strength, pierce the mountain. Sword, split the water. Fame, reach the imperial villa. The two of us will hold the heavens together. Hephaestus felt her heart race as she instinctively shifted her stance. Blinking in surprise, she looked at her sword and said, I... I think I can. A silver back roared and rushed through the crowd, mowing over citizens and adventurers alike. Tsubaki glanced towards the towering white-furred ape and shifted her stance, placing a hand on her katana. Seems like we'll find out. Triple X. I knew it. I fucking knew I should have updated my status. Dozens of projectiles flew towards me as I raced across Main Street. Crystal flower petals, rocks, weapons, even a few energy blasts. I growled and swept my hand out, grabbing them in my inventory and instantly firing them all back. Try to change the genre to be slice of life for a bit and reality says no. You're a shounen character. Have some battle scenes and surprise monster invasions. Welf swung the makeshift greatsword I crafted for him and said, You're not making any sense, bro. Ryua finished chanting a wind spell to blow away the monsters blocking our path and said, I agree with Welf. I'm not making sense. A horde of kobolds that looked like they got infected with the mushroom infection from The Last of Us jumped out of a crack in the ground before rushing towards us. I reached into my inventory and grabbed an axe before whipping it at the horde like a certain god of war, mowing them all down. Afterwards, I called it back and growled. This whole world doesn't make sense right now. Who in their bloody mind got out of bed today and said, Oh. Let's watch the world burn. Triple X. Dionysus sneezed. Mike frowned and said, Are you coming down with a cold, D.I.O.? If you would like, I can have Naza make you some medicine. Dionysus waved his hand and smiled. I appreciate it, Mike. But I am fine. He wiped his nose with the back of his sleeve and smiled. Just a bit of pollen. I've been cultivating some new flowers recently. But that aside. He reached out and placed a glittering orange vial on the table in front of Mike and said, I heard from Hestia that you have a talented alchemist. Mike looked at the vial before glancing back at Dionysus. From Hestia. He smiled and said, Does that mean that Naz's potions have been working for Bell? I'm unaware of that. It was more in passing at the Divine Banquet. Ah. Mike nodded. That makes sense. But what's this? He picked up the vial to examine it. And then he froze, eyes widening in shock. Dionysus let out a serene smile and said, It's something that my familia picked up in the dungeon recently. It was a set of two and I have used one to test its properties, but it seems to be something that rapidly increases growth. Mike gulped, putting the vial back down with trembling hands. D.I.O. Oh no, Lord Dionysus. This dash. Dionysus kept smiling and said, Well. Do you think it will be useful? I've been thinking that a bit of innovation in the potions industry would go a long way towards helping adventurers, do you not agree? Chapter 49, It Was Wrong To Go Off Script Explosive power filled my body with every step I took. My newly forged and bulky muscles easily embracing that power and supporting my will. And hordes of what looked like mushroom zombie versions of monsters climbing out from the ground like a scene straight out of the apocalypse. I growled and summoned one of my giant stone slab from my inventory before grabbing it and swinging to down to squish a horde crawling out from a nearby hole. An explosion of gore that quickly dissipated into smoke. But more importantly, that hole was now covered. A storm of screeching wind arrows shot down to clean up the few monsters that escaped, and then Ryu landed beside me, frowning. Just what in the world is happening here? A scream echoed from nearby. A young girl with an overstuffed backpack collapsed on the ground, probably knocked off balance. A crimson lizard with tendrils for a face dashed towards her. The girl pulled out a short sword from her sleeve, one packed with mana. But it would be too slow. Before she could activate it, the lizard would reach her first. TCH. I clicked my tongue and then shot out a few shards of adamantite at the monster, along with a crystal leaf for good measure. An explosion of crimson blood and flames that quickly vanished, replaced with an eerie red magic stone that was laced with pulsating green veins. The young girl looked at me, eyes wide in shock. But just for a moment. After that, she blinked and her eyes defocused as she stared off into space. Not before she finished pulling out her short sword though. 
At that time, the ground cracked beneath me. Ryu reacted fast, sending a gust of wind out beneath us to send us flying. And as she did that, I saw a giant killer ant jump up, its crimson mandibles reaching up to snap us in half. I... The area around me started to glitter as shards of adamantite appeared. Hate. Light gathered as I looped them to gather speed. Random boss encounters. And then the giant killer ant vanished, erased by what amounted to machine gun fire. For good measure, I crafted a towering boulder and chucked it in the hole to plug it, as well as crushing whatever other mobs planned to crawl up. That done, I landed on the top of the boulder and crossed my arms, looking around the area. Chaos. That was the only way to put it. As if the world said I was having it too easy, we got a full-on dungeon break, or at least the equivalent of one. Looking towards Babel, I didn't see anything off. And I didn't see or feel any signs of monsters coming from that direction. Which meant that these monsters came from somewhere else. And wouldn't you know it. Today happened to be a festival being celebrated with tamed monsters. Ryu landed on the boulder beside me and said, I take it you are not in a good mood. No, Ryu. I'm not. Corpses littered the streets, both adventurers and civil liens. More were wounded. And combined, it made Main Street run red with blood. Fortunately, higher level adventurers were reacting. I saw the girls from the Hostess of Fertility fighting off monsters in the distance. Seer. Or Horny as Freya called her, was working with Mia to direct Otter and some other insanely powerful people throughout the city. Near the commercial district, I saw weapon merchants arming themselves with blades and passing those out to anyone that could fight. Near the entertainment district, there was a brown-skinned goddess sending out waves of charm to calm down monsters while scantily clad women rushed at them with weapons. Then there was Fina, Pira, and Bella running around the town square blowing up whatever monsters they came across and snatching up magic stones while Tia, Freya, and Artemis ran after the girls with furious expressions. Ah! Definitely going to get scolded for that later. But they would be fine. While they were kids, they were also kids of extremely powerful people who inherited the best from both parents. Fina was immortal, Pira was invulnerable, and Bella. I watched my youngest daughter run into a monster and mime a kiss. The moment she did, the monster stopped in its track, letting out a silly expression. And then Pira promptly split it in half with a broadsword twice her height. Something that made Bella burst out laughing. Okay. Maybe the best and the worst of both parents. Another flag to deal with later. Gotta make a mental note of that after sorting out who the mysterious voices in my head were. But for now. Let's see. A chaotic scene right out of the apocalypse. Monsters rampaging. Adventurers rushing to clean up the scene. Since we suddenly switched from slice of life to Shannon, there were probably going to be a lot of casualties. Going from the flow of events, this was a situation meant to get the MC motivated to get stronger and swear not to let something like this happen again. If it was a story, at least. But since this was reality, it really meant that there was some crazy bastard out there responsible for this. The question was, what the hell did they have to gain from this? Orario would be put on edge, meaning security would be tightened. So it definitely wasn't helpful if they had a secret agenda in the long term. I doubted it had anything to do with me since I still had yet to make a big splash on anything. Though that would definitely change after today. Then. Wealth. Did someone decide that this scenario was a good setup to ring out his hidden potential and force him to make magic swords that he had sworn off making? Maybe. But that was a bit unlikely. Freya? Did her familia members get fed up with me and want to get rid of me in the chaos? No. Even if they did. Freya was smart enough to catch wind of something like that. If they were going to try anything, it would be a head-on confrontation instead of this collateral damage situation. Overall, odds were that it wasn't related to me or anyone I knew. Then. Was this just some crazy bastard who wanted to watch Orario burn? I couldn't think of anything that a reasonable person would want with all of this. Ah. But then there were unreasonable people in this world, right? Like the record of the coalition between evil god Familia called. Evil us. A name said through gritted teeth. I blinked and looked over to see Ryua clenching her fists while staring out at the devastation. She had seemed nonchalant earlier, but I guess she must have just not seen the chaos yet since she was focused on me. Hey. I placed my hand on her shoulder and said, relax. 
we'll sort it out. Ryu flinched, looking at my hand. Then she gave me a weird look before sighing. After that, she nodded with a faint smile and said, Understood, Belle. Was that a flag? Definitely a flag. For the record, I'm not interested in you. Ryu rolled her eyes and said, I am well aware, you scoundrel. I pulled my hand away and said, and I keep saying, the situation with me and Seer isn't what it looks like. We just have to wait. I paused, realizing that someone was missing from our group. Where's Welf? Ryu blinked and looked at me. Then she looked around the area near us and said, was he not just following us? I face palmed. Damn it. I should never have given him that info about Shiro. Bastards copying that guy's bad parts too. Triple X. The sound of clashing steel. A monstrous roar cutting through the air, followed by thunderous fists raining down from above. Hephaestus trembled as she swung her sword to deflect the attacks. Left, right. Up, down. An attack from behind. Her body moved on its own will, pulling her away from danger by a hair's breadth each time. Hephaestus stepped back and swung up her sword. An explosion of sparks filled the air as clashed against the silverback's fist. It also made the monster stagger backwards for a step, but nothing else. Not even a scratch or a hair cut on the beast's hand. Seeing that, Hephaestus let out a wry laugh. I guess this is karma. Tsubaki was gone. Between the randomly collapsing streets and the mutated monsters, Hephaestus thought it'd be a better idea for Tsubaki to run off and help the others since Hephaestus could defend herself with. And it was a good idea. At first, Hephaestus was easily able to kill the Silverback and make a quick retreat to Deadless Street to try and avoid any other monsters. But then it came back. Not only that, but it tracked her down through Deadless Street, and now. Hephaestus stared at the monster in front of her and focused again. It was different now. Although the general form was that of a silverback, the monster had mutated. Hephaestus didn't know how, but it seemed to have come back to life and stronger than before. Silver fur laced with pulsating green veins. Crimson eyes and flesh that looked blackened with rot. A horrific monster that could strike fear into the hearts of any person. And a terrifying strength to match that horrible visage. The silverback charged again, throwing another punch. Like always, drew Hephaestus forward to block. But unlike before, she didn't have the strength to counteract it. A heavy impact. Hephaestus' arms turning numb from the blow. And then a follow-up attack sent her flying. Was it that she couldn't feel pain because she was protected by? Or was the pain so much that her body couldn't process it? Hephaestus didn't know. But she did know that she had crashed through three different buildings before bouncing along the ground for a bit. The sound of clattering steel echoed from beside her falling out of her hands and onto the ground. Ah! There was the pain. Hephaestus blinked, suddenly feeling aches in every part of her body. She couldn't see, so it must have fallen in her blind spot. But she had to get up. She had to get up, grab it, and keep moving. By this point, the high-level adventurers were bound to have started moving. And even if they hadn't, Tsubaki would probably double back to check on her at this point. But that wouldn't matter if she let herself get killed or forced to use her arcanum. So. A monstrous roar directly in front of her. A blackened fist rushing towards Hephaestus' face. Oh. She couldn't do anything about it. It was the end. Seeing that approaching fist, the only thought Hephaestus had was. I'm sorry, Welf. I'm sorry, Pira. I should have been better. And like that, Hephaestus closed her eyes. But. Sking. The sound of a clean cut. One followed by a loud thud as something fell to the ground and the silverback roared in pain. And after that. Get your hands away from my wife. Chapter 50, It Was Wrong to Copy a Faker. A sword forged from thin air and mana. Welf didn't know how it happened, but he knew that it was necessary to face the monster in front of him. Welf. He heard Faye speak up from behind him. Hesitant and also a bit embarrassed. To be honest, he was a bit embarrassed as well. He didn't think that he would say something like that, but it was already too late to take it back. So instead, he turned to give her a quick smile before focusing on the monster. It was a silverback. An ape-like creature with silver fur and hulking muscles. Kind of reminded him of Bell at the moment with his random muscle growth, actually. 
but that wasn't important. Welf grabbed the handle of the sword he forged and focused. The monster wasn't normal. Just like the others that had been appearing throughout the city, the silverback was corrupted by something. Slashes and scars covered the silverback's body, like it had been split apart over and over. But at the same time, eerie black vines stitched those severed parts back together, giving the monster the appearance of a haphazardly fixed stuffed animal. But more than that, it was strong. Welf wasn't as crazy as Belle who could apparently tell exactly how strong people were somehow, but he had been in plenty of dangerous situations. More since meeting Belle. And his instincts were telling him that the monster was strong. Strong enough to rip him apart if he wasn't careful. But. You think I'll lose in front of Faye? His heart was pounding. Whether that was because Faye was behind him, because he sprinted here on instinct, or because he was overdrawing his mana with the sword he made, Welf didn't know. But what he did know was. Burn out. He could kill it. The monster roared and pounced. W-E-L-F. Faye screamed. A black and silver blur approached, quickly resolving into a giant fist swinging at Welf's face. But he didn't retreat or try to parry. Instead, he swung his sword to meet the fist and shouted. False works. Static. Welf felt his sword connect with the fist and cut through. But the moment it did, he got a wave of feedback. Like his entire body was steel and something just slammed against it, sending a reverberation throughout. Information flowed into his head. Pictures on a screen of a young man facing off against a similar opponent. And then text, appearing in Welf's field of vision, overlaying the silver back. Static. Asterisk. The flames have died down. There are about 30 meters to the silver back. It'll take it less than 3 seconds to close this distance. Therefore. The outcome of this battle will be decided in the next 3 seconds. Asterisk. What? Is this? A sense of incongruency. Time had crawled to a halt as Welf faced off against the silverback. Even so, information continued to flow and words continued to appear. Asterisk. My mind is clear. I know the scope of my power. Projection using concept creation, basic structure, composition, production technique, growth experience, and accumulated years. A false reality that distorts the world engraved in the soul the embodiment of the fictional world using the theory of realization, fiction in fiction. Inheritance of battle technique, experience, and physical strength from Error Failed to reach source Failed to compile recorded recollection Asterisk Something cracked. The moment it did, time resumed, and the silverback charged. Welf blinked and then moved to swing his sword again. But as he did, he staggered, suddenly feeling like his body was wrong. That the limbs he used to stand and swing his sword were a bit too long. That the flow of his mana wasn't right. Clang. The sword that had cut through the silverback's fist before was pushed back. With it, Welf staggered. And because of that, he couldn't block the follow-up attack. But. You idiot. Someone else did for him. Faye pulled Welf back, opening up a gap between them and the silverback. The moment she did, Welf managed to get a hold of himself snapping out of his daze. That sense of incongruency vanished as well. And just in time. The silverback roared again, furious. The black vines that were keeping it together pulsed, slowly threading through its muscles as if trying to replace them. At the same time, its eyes started shining with a dark crimson light. Moreover, the pressure it exerted started to intensify. Faye tensed for a moment before stepping away from Welf and raising her sword. When she did, she looked at Welf and pursed her lips. Don't try to be a hero. I'll take care of this, so run away. Welf laughed and then raised his sword as well. Who said anything about being a hero? Pointing it at the silverback, he said, I've already had one goddess sacrifice herself for my sake. I won't let the one I love do the same. Faye's face turned red, but she pointedly ignored looking at Welf. Instead, she focused on the silverback and said, F fine. Then, let's dash. Before she could finish talking, an explosion erupted. The source was a group of towering black pillars with crimson lines glowing within them. Shortly after that, a torrential rain of light fell from up above. The silverback that had given Faye and Welf so much trouble, the terrifying monster that was getting stronger by the second. It ripped apart, turning into nothing more than a haze of black and red. 
but even that disappeared as a person landed in the middle of the pillars. Messy white hair. Sharp crimson eyes. A honed and muscular body that was covered in black plate mail with crimson lines threading through it all. And then a transparent energy shield on his left arm. Spoiler. After taking a look around to make sure the area was secured, Bell clicked his tongue and then glared at Welf. Oi, dumbass. Who told you to run off on your own like that? Welf blinked and then let out a sheepish laugh. Triple X. It was a mess. I should have known better than to start introducing foreign magical concepts when I still didn't even understand the baseline magic of this world. Still, on the upside I managed to learn a few interesting things. First, my muscles had just been bloated from the Satsui no ha I mean, from the killing intent that I used earlier. After venting a bit, my muscles went back to a more reasonable size. Second, whatever had corrupted these monsters had turned them into great crafting material. If I were to put it in game terms, it was like whatever I crafted got automatically enchanted. Well, that and they turned black and red like something an evil overlord would use, but that didn't matter too much. Third. I stared at Welf being fussed over by Hephaestus and then frowned. Storyteller's refrain seemed to be a dangerous skill. He was different. That guy had already been changing, but now that I looked at the way energy flowed around him, I could see that some circuits were starting to appear in his body. Faint lines in parallel beginning from his left arm and tracing out to his heart. Twenty-seven of them. Not only that, but his eye color had changed a bit too. Since I met him, they had turned a bit icy, changing from a clear blue to a glacial color. But now they were more silver than blue, like the color of frost reflecting the blue sky. A soft thud from beside me. Someone landing on the ground. I glanced over to see Ryua standing there with a thoughtful look on her face. Seeing that, I said, how's the situation? It's being controlled. But the damage. She clenched her fists. I sighed and said, yeah. It's going to be a mess after this. Monster breaking free and killing countless civilians and tourists. Newbie adventurers being overwhelmed and dying in droves. Because I was the cheat that I was, I managed to avoid the worst case scenario by pulling a Gilgamesh and spamming long range attacks with rare weaponry. Unfortunately, that also meant that it was going to be a huge ass mess in the upcoming Denatus because of all the shenanigans I pulled today. On the plus side, I should have leveled from this. On the downside, I really shouldn't have postponed that status update. Even if I thought that it was dangerous to rely on divine power instead of your own. Mostly because it seemed like my powers were evolving on their own regardless of my input. Damn it. Why couldn't I just be a side character in a cozy adventurer life ice guy? Just had to be the MC instead. And now whoever started this mess was definitely going to keep an eye on me for their next plans. Meaning I'd need to go back to the drawing board for even more contingencies. Like getting more party members. Because as much as I'd be able to solo entire familia, I'd rather not. Read enough stories to know that the mountain of cannon fodder never ended once that ball started rolling. Better to dissuade them all by building up a big force. Hmm. Maybe I should go take a trip to the shoddier districts in town sometime. If we were going full tropes and cliches, there are probably some slave party members or something there that would gladly help if I freed them, right? LL. Bell. Hello? Bell. I blinked and then realized that Welf was standing in front of me. Seeing that I was paying attention now, Welf grinned and said, Great. So, uh, what do we do now, Captain? I should punch you. Ha ha ha. I rolled my eyes and then kicked off the ground, rapidly summoning and desummoning platforms to reach the highest pillar I dropped so that I could get a bird's eye view of the surroundings. Yep. Looks like things were wrapping up now. The Freya Familia were out in full force combing through Main Street. The Hephaestus Familia and other merchants had secured the commercial district. For some reason, I could see that Ace Girl and Loki running through the entertainment district with a bunch of other adventurers, but that felt like a flag, so I ignored it. Then there was Tia, Freya, and Artemis in the central plaza scolding the kids while a Japanese guy oh. A Japanese god kept watch alongside a bunch of adventurers cosplaying as samurai. Yeah. Looks like this little plot point was over. At least, that should be the case. But knowing who I am and the fact that I haven't really had a big fight yet when this is a shounen genre story setting. A faint gust along the back of my neck. Bell. 
My name being called out by three different people. Clang. Sparks flew as one of my swords blocked a sharp shadowy tendril. You have grown stronger. Ah. So one of the voices in my head is the shadowy boss monster that almost wiped me, hi? Huh? Should have known. A familiar war shadow with grey and green eyes. And one that immediately sent out a wave of shadows, warping wealth, Ryu and Hephaestus away. Not to a dangerous place though. I could see in the distance that they suddenly appeared next to Tia and the others. But then an invisible ripple spread out, turning the world grey as well as making everyone else vanish. Man. I reached into my inventory and pulled out a spear before pointing it at the war shadow. This world really wants to power check me today, hi. Hey. That is because the world will not survive if a hero does not appear. A calm and refined female voice echoed from the war shadow. And when it did, the shadows around it dispersed revealing a beautiful woman. Long flowing silver hair. A lacy black dress. Black gloves and matching leather boots with a black choker as an accessory. And a face that seemed weirdly familiar. She smiled, reaching out to pluck a sword from thin air the same way I grabbed my spear. It's been quite noisy around you recently. Do you have any regrets about it? Only that the world seems to keep throwing me curveballs. The war shadow no. The weirdly familiar woman nodded and said, I agree. But that's to be expected. Now. She pointed her sword at me and said, let us see who you take after more. Your father, or dash. An explosion of light. Sparks flying from a barrage of adamantite shards deflecting off an invisible barrier surrounding the woman. I clicked my tongue. No cuts seen skip today, hi. The woman laughed. And then she vanished. I immediately pulled out a slab to block my neck. And then I got a boot to the face and was sent flying off the pillar.